Okay, folks, I, I'll, uh, I'll get the, um, the webinar started now. And as people jump on, I think they'll be able to pick up as, as we go. So uh, welcome so much uh, for the second annual LTR uh, student uh, introduction webinar. Uh, we're thrilled that you're taking the time and interest to come online and learn more about the, about the LTR uh, and how the LTR can help and support our youth students. So joining me today in alphabetical order is Alan Berkowitz from BES. Alan, do you want to do a quick introduction? Yeah, I've um, been the head of the education team of the Baltimore Ecosystem Study for 21 years, and I work at the Cary Institute in Millbrook, New York. Thanks, Alan. Um, and uh, our featured speaker today, uh, Dr. Dan Childers. Uh, good evening, everyone, or afternoon, I guess, for some people. Good evening for the rest of you. Um, I'm Dan Childers. I'm a professor in the School of Sustainability here at Arizona State University. I'm the director of the Central Arizona Phoenix LTER program. Um, I'm an ecosystem ecologist. I study um, wetlands and I study cities. Um, and I have been, well, you hear a little bit more about this story. Um, well, you'll hear a story about this um, during my talk in a few minutes, but I've been part of the LTER network um, for basically my entire career, even including my uh, educational career. Oh, thank you. And, uh, and Clarice Hart from Harvard Forest. Hi, everyone. I'm Clarice Hart, and I am the Director of Outreach and Education at Harvard Forest. I've been working with this LTER site in Massachusetts uh, for 12 years, and I do a lot of network-wide activity with Alan and others on education and communications and also diversity. Hey, thank you. Uh, and uh, I'm Sam Norland from the Network Communication Office, and I've been with the office for about two years now. And uh, I'm based up in, up in Alaska in Fairbanks, and I, I do a lot of place-based education work up here with teachers and students. Thank you. All right, and so just a little bit about the, how this seminar is gonna, or this webinar is gonna operate. Uh, we'll take a couple minutes at the top to uh, ask a couple of questions of our attendees, and we'll then talk about then Dan will talk about the, um, about the LTR network uh, in more detail. And then I'll jump in and we'll talk a bit about the ways that you can stay connected with the LTR while you're um, an RU student and then afterwards. And then Alan and uh, Clarice will talk about uh, more opportunities for our RU students. And then if we have any questions uh, towards the end, we'll wrap, wrap up with uh, some conversation at the end of the, end of the, at the, end of the webinar. So, as you, a little bit about the technology. Uh, if you haven't used Zoom before, a Zoom webinar before, as you've noticed, you are muted. So feel free to talk amongst yourselves or uh, make noise. Don't worry, we can't hear you. Uh, and uh, if, if you do have questions though, on the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A uh, button. Click that and type your questions in. So feel free to type those in anytime and we'll, stop, we'll pause episodically throughout the, the hour to answer your questions as we can. And then we'll also put up some poll questions and that'll pop up on your screen, uh, fill it out, and we'll get, get some data that way as well. So hopefully we'll get some feedback from you and uh, we can answer some questions as well. So I'm gonna try to drive and hit the poll question at the same time. So in the Q&A section, uh, if you can, uh, type in where, what site you're, you're working at. We'd love to know uh, where you are uh, in, this, in the big LTR network. So take a, a moment to fill out that uh, Q&A question. And I'm going to toss the poll question up now. Um, you kind of have an idea of like how long do you think a research project needs to be to be long term? So we say long term ecological research all the time. What does long term mean in your opinion? I'd love to know what you, what you, what you think. And okay, the poll should be up now. And then um, what another question I'd like to have you ask answer is what What's one thing you'd most like to learn about the LTR network? That, this question can come back around towards the end as we've talked more about it, but feel free to toss any questions you have right away into this, into this, um, into this Q and A. So a couple of people, uh, all right, are saying uh, for number one, in your opinion, how long does a research project need to be for it to be long term? And so far people are, uh, we've got most attendees responding. I'll give it another few seconds. And the, so far, the winner is uh, three decades. That's a pretty, pretty fair assessment. 
And then how many LTR sites we visited? Uh, lots of folks have been to one, that's great. Uh, I, I, I didn't want to put zero there because you are at a site. And someone has number four. So we'll come back to number four, uh, to four sites again later on. So that's, that's a, an impressive number. Uh, just out of curiosity, Alan and Therese and Dan, how many sites have you been to? I think six. Okay, that might be a new winner. I would, I would have to, you, you sort of surprised me with that one. I have no idea. I've probably been to two thirds of the sites, I would guess. I think I've been to five. Fantastic, I, I've been to four, oh, so. Six, six. Six, Sorry. okay, well, add, add another one there, excellent, okay. Seven. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll stop. Okay, well, you keep counting. All right, uh, I, I think that's a, that's a great, uh, Great chance uh, for us to talk, I think, going forward now about maybe share results here if we can see these. Nice. All right, and um, I'll, uh, I'll get the Q&A in, in a second here as, as we go forward. Um, let's see, so we've got people here from uh, VCR, from Morea. All right, Morea. Exclamation points. Uh, Everglades. We have someone here from Fairbanks. Fantastic. I don't know. If, I don't know if that is Bonanza or Arctic. We'll see. And we have someone from KBS. Good to see. We're using All a right. lot of phrases here that you guys will learn later, like where Maria is and what KBS is. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. That was the point of that question. Thank you, Clarice, for doing my job. Fantastic. All right, so uh, now we have a little bit of that out of the way and some introductions. I'm gonna hand this over to Dan. So Dan, please steal this away from me. All right, I think I've stolen it. You have, I will go on mute, thank you. All right, so y'all already know who I am. I'm not gonna tell you that anymore. My job is to uh, give you a quick, quick overview of um, what the LTER program is. Um, and what about the LTR makes it a network? So what the LTR network effectively is. Um, as I already said, I'm the current director of the CAP LTR program here in Phoenix. So um, the program was established by the, 19, by the National Science Foundation in 1980. So it's been around for almost 40 years now, almost exactly 40 years. Um, we'll go through a timeline of when the, the sites have been funded and in some cases terminated in a few slides. Uh, currently, um, the network can say, can claim, and includes, sorry, it's been a long day, 28 sites. Um, and they're mostly in the continental United States, but as you can see, there's four in various places in Alaska. There are two in Antarctica, one in Puerto Rico, um, which is obviously part of the United States, and then one Morea um, coral reef out there in um, Tahiti. In French Polynesia, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the idea that NSF had back in, the, in 1980 when they started this was to re represent as many um, biomes in the United States as possible. Um, now, the little th symbols that you see on that map over there represent thousands of researchers from universities, colleges, government agencies, NGOs, um, all over the country. Um, and we have been, as a network over that 40 years, we've been extremely prolific in not just producing um, information, long-term information, but also producing um, lots and lots of papers and lots of impactful theoretical outputs. These are some photos of some of the sites here. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background in a few slides about my experience with the Florida Coastal Everglades site. That's the upper left-hand corner. That's one of our beautiful mangrove forests. Most of these um, pictures here are representing what is actually mo well, the way most people think about the LTR network, which is that it is representative of these largely um, human um, sparse, not human dominated ecosystems where people are just visitors and that kind of thing. Um, although in that lower left-hand corner, that's a slide from Kanza Prairie, you can see that the people are a little more than visitors there. Um, but it's an important point to note that um, two of the LTER sites funded in 1997 um, are located in cities. And these two sites are exclusively charged with studying cities as urban ecosystems. 
One is located here in Phoenix, that's CAP. The pictures across the top there are from Phoenix, and the other urban LTER is Baltimore, and it's located obviously in Baltimore, and those photos on the bottom are from Baltimore. So just be aware that everything isn't all nature, that we're actually studying human nat nature interactions in the LTER network as well. Now, what is the LTER? So the LTER, there's a photo from the Maria Coral Reef site, um, is first and foremost about long-term observations. And we'll talk in a few minutes about the core areas that tend to dominate these long-term observations. Um, LTER sites, especially those that have been around for 20, 30, 40 years, have multi-decadal um, data sets for a lot of very important environmental variables, ecological variables, hydrological variables, climatological variables. Um, this is the core of what we do in LTER, is maintain these long-term records. It basically is making the same measurements over and over and over again. And it's with these long-term trends that we are able to detect environmental change the same way with the long-term CO2 record from Mauna Loa in Hawaii that has allowed us to see very clearly what we are doing with fossil fuels to the atmosphere. So long-term data is extremely important. The other thing that we do is long-term experiments. And um, most sites are involved to some way, shape, or form in, uh, in experiments. Experiments that go on for decades, um, experiments that are added to, experiments that are, that are ended if, if we've learned everything we need. Um, one of the interesting things that has come out of a lot of these long-term LTER experiments is this idea of surprise. And so you see the, 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 the systems responding to a particular manipulation in a predicted way um, for 10, even 15 years, and then suddenly something happens and the way those systems are behaving relative to the manipulation that we put on them completely flips. And so there's lots of really fascinating theoretical surprises and practical surprises that have come out of our long-term experiments. The other thing that we do is build long-term relationships. And so LTER is fundamentally a science program, um, but we're also about communicating our science to the people who need it the most, um, which are resource managers, policymakers, uh, landowners, folks like that. And obviously we have very important long-term relationships with educators. And then last but not least, one of the things LTER does very well is expand opportunities. And you y'all are an excellent example of one of the important programs that we have for expanding opportunities to undergraduates with our hope that we will get you into the graduate school pipeline and eventually get you sitting in a desk like mine at a university, um, should that be where you want to go. Um, but then we have opportunities for um, expanding our opportunities for expansion in all kinds of different ways. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about about that in just a few moments. And so fundamentally, this is a great quote. The long-term ecological environmental studies that we are conducting in LTR allow us to better understand the variability of natural systems to deter trends and shifting baselines, sort of like those surprises I talked about, and to witness rare events and unanticipated ecological surprises. There it is, surprise. All right, so this is, um, this is a really interesting graphic. This is a timeline of the funding of the 28 LTER sites that I talked about a minute ago. And you can see up at the top there that the, fund, the timeline starts in 1980 and it goes to last year. It looks like it goes till 2018, but that's okay. Um, so I mentioned that I spent my entire career in LTER and I just wanna give you all an idea of where that started. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, there's a blue um, coastal box for a no longer existent site called the North Inlet LTER. Um, and North Inlet was located at the Baruch Marine Lab in South Carolina. Um, it didn't hang on very long, um, but during the time that it was funded, I did my master's degree there. And so basically I started my graduate work in LTER. Um, and if you move, uh, let's see, about two thirds of the way down, there's a, a whole slew of blue coastal sites down there. One of them is the Florida Coastal Everglades LTER which has been funded for 19 years now. We were funded in the year 2000. I was the funding uh, director for um, FCE, as we call it, and I ran that program for almost 10 years before coming here to um, ASU. And then of course, like I said, I am currently um, one of those two red bars, which are the urban sites. I'm currently the director of CAP. And so there's some interesting things that you see here. All of those bars do not make it all the way to the right-hand side of the graphic. and so. Over time, some LTER sites have been terminated by the NSF, that is their funding has been cut off. Um, for the first 30 years of the um, program, there were only three sites that that happened to. 
um, the Okefenokee River site and the Okefenokee Swamp site and the Illinois River sites only made it for one six-year funding cycle. North Inlet made it through two, um, and for various reasons, those three sites were terminated. But let's highlight um, where I put the asterisks here. And the first place where I forgot to put an asterisk is Shortgrass Step, and you can see that Shortgrass Step was um, terminated by the NSF um, in about 2014, I guess. Um, that's about the same time that the NSF terminated the Sevieta LTER site. Um, but then they decided to have another grassland competition because both Shortgrass Step and Sevieta were airland grassland sites, um, and Sevieta won their funding back. Um, the other asterisks represent the Coweta LTER, which has more recently been terminated by the NSF, and the Baltimore Ecosystem Study LTER, which just this past summer was terminated by the NSF. And so, and so we've had basically a loss of three sites um, from the, the LTR portfolio um, in the last 10 years, um, compared to three sites lost um, over the 30 years before that. Um, and the interesting thing is that during the, the time that those three terrestrial sites have been cut off of, from their funding, if you look at the very bottom right-hand corner of this graphic, you can see that three new coastal oceans or oceanic sites have been funded. Um, and so Biological Oceanography Organization in the Geology, Geology Directorate um, has been stepping up and funding sites at the same time that the Biology Directorate, um, which is the original directorate that hosted and LTER has been terminating sites. Uh, in fact, as it stands now, it's kind of an interesting observation that half of the 28 sites um, that are in the network are actually funded by the Geology Directorate, mainly Biological Ocean. So maybe LTER is becoming LTOR, who knows. Um, so we mentioned, I mentioned earlier that we have these core areas. And these core areas are where we tend to focus a lot of our um, pattern type of analysis, a lot of our long-term uh, data collection on pattern, ecological pattern. Um, and so we look at uh, primary production, patterns in primary production. Um, we look at um, the dynamics of ecological populations and communities, um, including things like trophic interactions and food webs, um, we track organic matter, and a lot of sites track organic matter in soil. Um, we track the movements um, and, and patterns of inorganic nutrients through all types of media, soils, groundwater, surface water, precipitation, nutrients in the air, in the atmosphere. And then, of course, a big com component of all LTERs and of ecology in general is disturbance. So these are the five core areas that have been around since 1980, but in 1997, when NSF added the two urban sites, they added two more core areas for those two urban sites to have to deal with. Um, and those two core areas that Baltimore and us here in Phoenix need to be also studying is social ecological interdisciplinary system dynamics um, and how land use land cover change is um, being affected by the process of urbanization. So we already talked about um, LTER science, including long-term observations. Again, a lot of these observations tend to be of ecological pattern, all right? which makes sense, um, and a lot of these long-term observations go back to the core areas. For some of our sites, we have 40 years of, the 39 or 40 years of data for some of those core areas. It's just a remarkably rich, rich data set. LTER science includes experimentation. I mentioned that as well. Um, there are all kinds of really cool long-term experiments that have been going on at a bunch of LTER sites. The classic ones include the massive watershed manipulations that have always been done at Hubbard Brook, um, the, the very uh, intricate biodiversity experiments that have always been done at Cedar Creek. There are lots of soil warming plot um, experiments going on all over the place. Um, there's a 200-year decomposition of um, large logs experiment that was started at Andrews Forest, and they anticipate continuing that for hundreds of years. Um, lots of nutrient addition experiments to the lake. Lots of sites are doing that kind of thing. Um, and what you see is in that photo, this is actually kind of cool, um, is the, the folks at Hubbard Brook, who love long-term experiments, decided that they wanted to simulate a, um, an ice storm, a winter ice storm. And so they went out there with this, I don't even know what that thing is because I've never lived in a cold place before, but it looks like, looks like a fire, <clears throat> when the, it looks like a fire hose. And what they did went out when it was below freezing, obviously, and they fire hosed a piece of the forest to simulate um, a, uh, an ice storm in a very controlled way. And then they've been tracking what happened to the forest when all of the branches broke and who knows what else happened after that. 
Um, so there's another great example of a long-term experiment. Of course, one, the other thing that we do is we do a lot of modeling. Um, we use conceptual models to um, organize our, our research and to com communicate the way our research fits together into a central package. Um, we use mathematical models and simulation models um, to make predictions and projections based on um, the experimental and the long-term observation data that we have. Um, so there's lots of data for validation, verification of those models. These models are used for cross-site comparisons where you develop a model for one ecosystem at one LTER site, and you pack your model up and you take it to another LTER site, um, and you see how well that, how generalizable your model is to another completely different type of ecosystem. We do a lot of synthesis, and in fact, we have a, um, a, an entire synthesis program that's run by the Network Communications Office, which is um, based at NCs in Santa Barbara. Um, we have the Environmental Data Initiative, which is at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, which is the main deposit, depository for LTER data. Um, you can find data there. You can also find data publicly available through any, any of the 28 individual LTR data or LTR websites um, and a lot of our LTER information managers are also making our data publicly available through data one. So there's lots and lots of data out there to do lots of cool synthesis. And then the one I'm most intrigued with, um, both because of my experiences at, uh, in the Everglades LTR and because I've been working here at CAP and doing urban, um, urban ecology for a decade or more, is this making science relevant to society. This is becoming more and more important in LTER. It's becoming more prevalent and more recognized across the network. Um, some sites do this routinely daily, some sites do this on a sporadic basis, um, but this is communicating our science in, in a digestible, practical way um, to all kinds of audiences, whether they're practitioners, people making decisions, the media, public, the public, there's all kinds of ways that we do this. The NCO, the Network Communication Office, helps us with this. Um, and this is particularly important now because NSF last year um, discovered the importance of, of its science being made relevant to society. Um, and they now refer to this as what's called convergence science. And so this is, this is NSF's push to have direct relevance to society and to be directly, directly helpful to society. I think it's really important. And then of course, LTR includes partnerships. And we mentioned this at the beginning. And these partnerships are with, depending on the site, all kinds of different types of organizations, um, all kinds of different types of governance, um, lots and lots of connections with education. And all LTER sites have a um, schoolyard program for K-12 connectivity. Um, and then we obviously have our REU program, which you guys are part of. There are lots and lots of cool ways that LTER gets its science out to its partners and engages its partners in the way that we do science and in actually collecting the data. At this point, I am going to hand it back to Sam. Hey, thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. Uh, do a quick... Another reminder for the uh, folks online, uh, if you have any questions, please either uh, type those questions in the Q&A box or feel free to use the, the chat window as well. You can communicate to each other or you can uh, ask us questions. So speaking of questions, time for another poll. So uh, just to kind of gauge everybody's interest in thinking about their future, I know that's always a fun topic. Uh, let's talk about what you might want to do with uh, how to stay connected with the LTR. And if you might want to think about doing another RU or attending uh, graduate school at a, at, a, at, a, at a LTR site, or maybe choosing a different path to graduate school, or maybe choosing a non-academic path after you graduate from undergraduate uh, classes. So take a moment to fill this out and uh, I'll give you a few seconds to fill up the poll before I close it and post it. And again, this is anonymous. So don't worry about uh, anybody seeing what you clicked on. Right, so another five seconds.
And it looks like most folks are thinking about uh, returning uh, to the LTR sites, a different site possibly, uh, as a graduate student. That's fantastic to hear. And so folks want to come back as a grad student to uh, your current site. And one person wants to do a different path to grad school. All right, fantastic. And also, as we, as we go throughout this, this talk today, uh, please be thinking about what are some of the resources that would help you um, in your current RU experience. So what would you want to tell the next group of students coming in uh, what would make them uh, have a better experience or have, a, have the same experience that you found very beneficial uh, to you as well. So what resources have you found during your time as an RU? What have you enjoyed? What has made your experience beneficial to you in your potential career? And also just your, your ability to uh, function day to day. There's a lot, of, a lot of work that you do as, a, as an RU student. And you know, what, what's working for you and what would you like to see uh, changed? So feel free please to, uh, to, as this talk goes on, to write that up in the Q&A and maybe we can address some of those, those topics now or in the future. So speaking of um, RUs, the, the LTR sites work, I hopefully work very hard to support you and your endeavors and your future career goals and your research goals. Um, and some of the ways that, that you can stay engaged with the LTR after you leave are up here. So for example, we have a directory of all of the researchers who are working in the LTR currently. Uh, so if you were fascinated by something that you were tangentially related to working on uh, in your RU uh, time, jump on this directory and try, and try to find people that, and faculty that are aligned with your interests. And you can uh, contact them, pursue them for possible graduate school. Uh, we also have the US LTR Facebook page and uh, other social media accounts such as Twitter, uh, which is more science uh, and data sharing and science communication, which um, as you progress through your career, that might be more appropriate or more applicable. And the uh, Instagram account is, is a great, uh, great way to stay uh, informed of what's happening visually with the LTR site. I think this week and next week, the grad students take over the account fully and they're, they're in charge. They're, they're uh, posting all of the, all the photos uh, for the next two weeks. Um, and also for YouTube, uh, it's a great place if you're looking for more information about certain topics, educational topics. Maybe you'll be TAing a course uh, next year or coming up. These are some great resources for you as you start uh, thinking about how, what you want to do to build presentations, to think about uh, teaching, to think about ways to communicate science. And then also we had a, uh, which I think this might be interesting if you're new to the LTR, we had a, a blogger and photographer named Erica Zambello who traveled to about two thirds of the, of the uh, sites, LTR sites, and she um, blogged her, her, her time and took photographs. And it's a, it's a, a story map. So if you go to bit.ly slash LTR story maps, a story map, uh, you can, you can uh, follow along and, and uh, read her experience uh, traveling to the different LTR sites as, as a non-scientist. And how you access all this, all this information, if you go to, um, ltrnet.edu, it gives you a chance to uh, log in to uh, sign up for uh, email alerts, uh, to find all the social media accounts, to uh, look at up upcoming resources for students and meetings. So please take a look at the, if you haven't already, take a look at the website. There's a whole host of information and resources available to, uh, to RU students here. So please take a look. Um, do a quick check of the Q&A. Well, um, I'm gonna call out Cora Johnson right now because uh, it's, a, it's a positive one. Uh, our site director, Cora Johnson, is, has been a great and super supportive in answering our questions. So I'll make sure we tell that to, to Cora, so make, make her very happy. All right, so I'm going to uh, pass this off to, uh, to Clarice yeah. and Alan. Okay, um, so, Sam, before before I talk about, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, you yes, want to see, see me too? You probably don't need to see. It. Anyway, um, before we go on to this, can you go back to the last slide, please? Um, or the one before that, actually. So I guess I'm asking, will we make this PowerPoint or some facsimile of it available to the participants so that you can get all these links? Of course, sorry if I was, I didn't say that before. Yes, the uh, PowerPoint and the recording will be available um, online and emailed out to participants. And it'll, we'll have a link also in the future people can, who haven't been able to attend, but did sign up, will have access to this. Yep. 
so because I assume all these links that are links these, these are all these are all live links. Yep. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. So now if you can hop onto the, I I hope that's helpful for at least some of the participants. So, so I'll, I'll take my slide if you want to go on to the, yeah. So we want to talk with you a little bit about um, what you can do. You're, I, I think most of you are in RU programs or all of you are in RU programs now. And for instance, my RU program here at the Cary Institute, the students are giving their talk tomorrow. And a lot of your focus, a lot of my students' focus is probably on presenting your research or finishing up your research at your site. But there are opportunities to present your research and to make more connections, building on what you've already done um, beyond just the summer. And I wanted to say a little bit about those. So if you go to the next slide. So the, um, there's a number of scientific societies that have um, annual meetings um, that are really exciting to present at. And almost all of them have a special student registration fee. Believe it or not, $255 for the Ecological Society is about half the price of the regular <laughs> uh, registration. So some of these meetings are, are expensive and they're a major way that the professional societies raise money so, or, or get money for their operations. So that's um, why this is not a small number. Um, and the students, the students that get the student registration are asked to do some volunteering in, in response for that. And there are travel grants to attend the Ecological Society meeting. Um, if you go to the next, hit the, hit the advanced um, AG. So Ecological Society is a very broad range of topics. Ecology has become very broad, just like the LTR network. So um, there are lots of social, ecological, um, a pretty br very broad diversity of topics. The American Geophysical Union is actually, um, just as Sam pointed out, that the geology director at NSF is a major supporter of many of the LTR sites. And so the Geophysical Union, even though it sounds like it's hard-nosed geologists only, is not. It's actually a very broad sweep of, um, of environmental sciences. Um, even more expensive meeting, but a really great meeting. Uh, it happens every year, just about the same time in December in San Francisco, not a bad place. Um, you missed the abstract deadline for this year, but it's a meeting to think about for the future. And if you go to the next, hit the next one, please. Um, the the Limno Society for the Limnology and Oceanography is um, also a great meeting for those of you that are working in, in the aquatic arena. Um, and as you see, all these have, is there one more, Sam? Um, so you see this is this coastal and estuarine. Yeah, this used to have a slightly different name, but um, um, this is another, for those of you that are at the coastal sites, I think some of you are, um, this is a, a really cool meeting um, that happens in the fall. So these are meetings that, that have travel grants um, and sometimes scholarships through these professional societies. Um, I know that the Ecological Society has a special mentoring program available through SEEDS. So the um, SEEDS program is available. ASLO has a mentoring program available. So these are definitely societies worth looking up and almost certainly your advisor or your mentor will know about these and help you think about which one you might um, be best positioned to apply to. Um, next slide. So in addition, there are some, actually there's some money for, so for those of you that are at RU sites, this pool of money that this slide talks about is, I will tell you, it's, it's very underutilized. So um, there is money for, there's somewhere about 140 L RU sites in biology, about half of which have environmental, and some of you are probably at one of those sites. And, um, and, and there is money for one student from each site to go to a meeting. And um, as you see, it's a first come, first serve. You need a letter, you need to apply, and you need a letter from your mentor. But this is a really, really, really great way to get funding support to go to any of the meetings that I just showed you or other meetings. So there's a number, you know, there's many other meetings. So I really encourage you to think about this. And I don't know the answer to the question of whether people that aren't at LTR sites but are funded through RU supplements are, are eligible to apply. It, it probably doesn't hurt um, 
check you know, touching bases with with them to find out. Um, Sam, did something just change? Go to the next. There's the next one. Um, another experience. Another opportunity is through the Council on Undergraduate Research. Um, you need to get nominated for that by your um, mentor. Um, we at here at Cary Institute send a student to that every year. Um, they have a tremendous time. It's really a great opportunity to be in Washington and present your research and meet other undergraduates. And I think, is there one more? Um, um, then the all scientists meeting happens every three years. Um, last year for the first time in, in 2018, for the first time we actually had a funding stream for undergraduates, RU undergraduates to come to the meeting. It was the first time that we brought a group of undergraduates to the all scientists meeting it was in Asilomar in California, a beautiful location on the California coast. Um, really a wonderful meeting. And I, I strongly encourage you to keep your eye out for an announcement of an opportunity for students to, to go to that meeting. It's, it's not until 2021. Um, so some of you might not still be an undergraduate, but you have to look at the fine print to see if you're still eligible to participate. If not, um, it, it, either as a graduate student or, or as an undergrad because of your prior affiliation. Um, next slide. Um, and Clarice, I'm turning it over to you, or is this is this you, um, um, Sam? Yeah, so it looks like there's a poll right. asking how many of you have attended a national conference. And then Sam, I think, is also probably loading a Q&A to ask for those who have attended a national conference or, or a regional conference, some kind of conference that they've presented their research at, what advice do you have for others? So while that's going on, Sam, if you can just advance it one more tick there. Okay, so most of you haven't attended a national conference, but some of you have. Um, so just my advice that I have, and others should feel free to jump in. Number one, so I'm super introverted, and I would say a lot of ecologists are pretty introverted. So it's pretty easy to go to a conference and just, you know, do your poster or do your talk and then retreat <laughs> into yourself and not speak for the rest of the conference. But I want to encourage you to really take advantage of these conferences if you attend one. Um, and some of the advice that I have come up with is introduce yourself to the person sitting next to you. If you sit down at a talk before it starts, try to get there early. And introduce yourself. Um, I've had a lot of great collaborations come from just doing that. Um, follow up with at least one speaker, either right after their talk, go up to them, or follow up via email. I've also had some great connections from having the courage to do that. Visit the exhibit hall. The exhibit halls can be really overwhelming. Often these conferences are in a big convention center and the exhibit hall is like, you know, seven football fields wide and it's full of tables and it's awkward because you walk up to these tables and you sort of feel like you have to say something to them, but just take a breath, walk up and ask what opportunities they have for students or ask them to tell you a little more about what they do. These might be book publishers. These might be kind of scientific equipment vendors who want to show you their carbon dioxide machine. Um, these could be educators, could be all different kinds of people. And often there's free stuff, which is like a reward for having the courage to go up to a table. Um, read the meeting bulletin board. These big meetings usually have a bulletin board and they post jobs there. Um, anybody who attends can post something there. So sometimes there are cool events going on. Um, lots of networking can be done at the bulletin board. Visit the poster session. You're going to have your own poster, but don't just do your own poster. Also try to visit other posters. Go up to five different posters and ask each presenter about their research and also how they got into that research. That can really spark conversations and help you understand paths that might be different from what you would assume a path might be. And then the last thing is to pace yourself. These meetings usually have dozens of concurrent talks or events going on at one time. I, I try to make myself go to 75% of the things that are offered at a big like week long conference that even that is a stretch. You can get some brain fatigue. So remember to pace yourself and go to the things that are really important to you. Does anybody uh, have yeah, other can advice? Can I chime in with uh, one more? One more piece of advice. Um, most of these associations have student something or other. So some they, they either have a student section or a chapter or a committee or an organization, and you can usually find out about it on the society's website 
or if you look for kind of business meetings or socials that are organized by these subgroups. So for instance, the Ecological Society has a very active student section. And if you can find out a little bit about the student section before the meeting, you probably can find another student, maybe a little bit further, you know, maybe a graduate student that would be willing to help you kind of get connected to other students at the meeting. If you're, if you're going on your own, um, that's a really great way to connect with people that are peers or near peers. Yeah, sometimes even um, there's on the, on the website for the conference, there's a section that says for students. And sometimes there's like a student 101 kind of area in the, in the exhibit hall. So definitely be on the lookout because people are always, always thinking of you guys and wanting to make your experience better. If I could jump in quick, just for the technical uh, question for folks. Uh, if, if anybody's not able to see the screen uh, or the slides, please uh, shoot me a, a message in the Q&A or the, or the chat field. It, uh, it should be viewable. And if it's not, uh, please let me know. I'll see what I, can, what I can do to fix it. It was sort of going off and on before, but it's better. I think it's better now. Okay. Sorry, um, sorry. So I'm sorry to interrupt. No problem. Dan, do you have anything else that you want to add? I'm going to guess that's a no. Okay, so one more slide, which is there are lots of ways to build your network. You're within the LTR network now. You're part of our family. We want you to travel around to different sites and to, to really take advantage of us as a network. There are a couple of other types of networks that you can join. So Alan had mentioned earlier things like the Ecological Society of America, ESA or AGU or AAAS, which is the American Association for the Advancement of Science. These all have kind of student chapters within them, and so that's a really great way to get going in your career and to learn from people who may be just a little bit further beyond where you are. Um, the, so if we kind of go down the slide, so Alan had mentioned that within ESA, there's the SEEDS program. They have local chapters, so even if you aren't able to make it to the national ESA meeting, you can get involved with a local chapter. So on this link, I have the map of all the local chapters and those are usually based at a university and I think they have them in almost every state, um, usually multiple chapters in each state. They also have something called a SPUR Fellowship. I forget what the acronym stands for, but it's a leadership fellowship for um, students who are willing to take part in this kind of 18 month experience, which includes an REU like program, but also includes a leadership summit and a field trip to an LTER site. And then you present at ESA the next year. It's a really awesome program um, by application, of course. SOCNIS, um, which is for Latino and Native, Native Americans in science. Um, is a great organization and their conference is always in a really fantastic place. So you can get involved with your regional chapter, you can get involved with a local chapter. They have a national diversity in STEM conference and they also have an annual meeting that I think this year is in Honolulu. Um, and so that and the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, if you are a member of those uh, racial or ethnic groups, um, that can, this can be a really great resource for you and a way to network um, and kind of build your confidence. And I, I'm a member of SACNIS and it's great. Um, in the top right of the slide, we see LTER, the little logo there, but right below that is the ILTER, which is kind of an international unit of LTER. So LTER is not just in the United States, there are sites all over the world. And so you're part of the LTR network, which means that you have arms into different parts of the world, which is pretty cool. And they have a meeting every three years. Um, NEON is another ecological observatory network, which has multiple sites, just like LTER does. The Organization for Biological Field Station, again, has multiple sites. These are less sort of organizations for you to go to a meeting at and more organizations for you to just be aware of so that you can look at their website, look for opportunities. They usually have job boards. OBFS has hundreds and hundreds of field stations um, and a really great job board. And same with the CZO, which is the Critical Zone Observatory. It has a fewer number of sites, but lots of great opportunities at those sites. So that's what I have. And I think that we are now moving into the Q&A. So if you guys have questions for us, we would be happy to take them. 
Yeah, so um, Joshua asks or says, the resources of having firsthand work with researchers and being able to use resources from a university are very helpful. That's awesome. And a resource that could be useful as an RU would be a better network opportunity for the within the LTR community, uh, though possibly hosting an in-person seminar that we can present our research at. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think that's a, a concept we've been talking about for, for quite a while, I believe. Uh, trying to think of a, of a cross-site RU experience for students to have access to sharing uh, resources with each other and the, the larger network. So that's something we're, we're thinking and working on uh, currently. Anybody else have some comments that I'm totally overlooking on that, uh, that topic? I think it probably would work best if we, if we did that at, say, the NGU meeting or the Ecological Society meeting the next year. That would be really interesting if we could, and maybe even on the year, maybe if we think of the All Scientists meeting as a time when undergrads could come to the LTR itself, and maybe in the intervening, one of the intervening years, if we could have a similar kind of gathering of LTR undergrads at one of these science meetings, that would be really great. Yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, watch, watch the calendar for that. Um, and uh, in, in a minute, I'm going to open up the, uh, the lines so everybody can talk and say hi to each other. And one more poll question for you before, but before that, I just want to say that um, thanks so much for participating. Uh, if you have any more questions, we'll get to them in a second. I just want to make sure I said thank you to everybody. And that uh, we're hoping to have a, a second, second webinar this fall. Uh, we'd focus more on a roundtable of graduate students and, and, or, and early career faculty and focusing on the next step for graduate school, different pathways for careers uh, through academia. And uh, if you have any questions uh, or concerns about the uh, webinar or future webinars, please please shoot me an email. My email is up on the, on the screen there. Um, I don't believe we have any more Q and A questions here, uh, but if uh, it's giving everybody a heads up, I'm going to open up the, the lines to talk in a, in a second. Uh, if you have a new version of Zoom, that is, uh, so make sure you hit mute right now if you don't want to you don't want to talk, but. Uh, if you do want to talk, just hit unmute and say hello and where you're from. I can also also unmute you uh, if you're not careful. So, so uh, best hit uh, hit mute and say hello. Or not, that's fine. Um, if you have any other questions, though, please uh, please email me, and we'll try to try our best to answer them. And if you have any questions uh, right now, please uh, type them into the uh, Q and A box. And uh, Dan, uh, Alan, and Clarice, thank you so much for for um, giving your time today and participating in this webinar. Thank and you for organizing, Sam. Oh, yeah. no, thank you. And thanks to all of you guys who tuned in. And oh, we have, oh we have, yes, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, one question from Kate. Kate, uh, the webinar for next time, yes, this webinar, sorry, will be for RU students. Uh, so you can ask questions, uh, to ask questions from these graduate students. So you'd ask the graduate students questions, they can give you feedback and information about, about uh, grad school or, or uh, career prospects. Absolutely. And that'll be the, hopefully this fall. So, so if I'm right that many of you are getting ready to wrap up your RU experience, I wish you luck in, in finishing up and giving the presentation or the poster or whatever um, it is that you're going to, to, to go and, and make sure that you um, figure out how to stay connected to the other students and to your mentors because you can really be active member of the community if you put a little bit of effort into it. And I think it's incredibly worthwhile to stay connected to the people that you've had such close connections with. That, that's good advice, Alan. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I just uh, launched a, a quick survey, just a quick uh, taking the temperature of this, of this webinar. So it, this is anonymous again, so feel free to um, 
give, give us just some feedback of how useful you found this webinar from not very useful to being very useful. It kind of helps us gauge on what's going well, what's not going well. So leave that up for a minute. Uh, any other uh, words of advice or wisdom from our panelists? I'm always full of advice, but I would, I actually am curious to know from you guys and you can type this into the Q and A or maybe even say something if you want. Um, was this webinar what you expected? Should we do exactly the same thing again next year? Are there things that you hoped that you would see? We're really interested in your feedback. You can answer now or otherwise we have to email you and make you fill out a form. So that, that's never very fun. <laughs> I'll just throw one more little bit out here. Um, as someone who, like I said, I started in the LTER network um, a long time ago doing my master's degree at North Inlet and I've been involved pretty much with, without a whole lot of break for the rest of that time. So um, it's an amazing group of people. Um, the every three year um, all scientists meeting that we have is, has gotten for me, I've been to so many of them, it's like a family reunion. Um, there's this multi-generational, non-hierarchical feel uh, about the, the, the group. And even though there's thousands of people spanning in age, range, huge age ranges, it's just an incredibly friendly and incredibly smart group of people. And so if, if you have any inkling and had any interest in staying involved in ecology, stay connected to LTER. I just, that's the best advice I can give. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Joshua. You uh, you won the first prize of uh, who's talking first. Thank you, sir. That's awesome. I feel like we actually should like mail him something. I, 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 <laughs> jo uh, Josh, Joshua, uh, email me your address, and we'll send you something fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it'll not, be it'll be it'll be fun and not not very expensive. Okay. All right. So I really I'll appreciate Kyler's. Um, suggestion to do this at the beginning of the summer i think that's that's a, you know that's kind of, that's the kind of feedback that's really helpful oh absolutely i, I need to scroll down on the, on the q a section is ltr something that you guys talk about at your sites within your reu program we had as alan mentioned we had reus at the ltrl scientist meeting last year and it was sort of mixed, I guess, who had really thought about LTR or really talked about it at their site. Some sites, I think, have a really strong LTR identity for every one of their students, and others, it's more dispersed. Yeah, we talk about it at, at our site. I'm at the Florida Coastal Everglades site, so I know that they say that it's the largest LTER site. Um, we don't, they don't go too much into detail of the other sites. Like, I didn't know about how you have two urban ecosystem sites. That's I found that really interesting. Um, but yeah, I think this was great to actually be able to learn more about the different sites um, and actually meet the people behind the LTER program. Hey, hey, Joshua. Yeah. I, since you're talking, I'm, I'm going to, so I, I was um, affiliated with FCE for a long time. Who are you working with this summer? Um, I'm in the Jennifer Rehage lab. Oh, very cool. Tell Jen that Dan said hi. Uh, okay, will do. One of the neat things that, um, that has happened, I think, within the LTR network, somewhat related to the addition of these urban sites is that a lot of the sites are now doing work that has to do with urban and human. I think that those are kind of parallel. So the Florida Coastal Everglades site has a very strong kind of socio-ecological um, framework. The, the sites in Massachusetts have, um, have strong urban um, components. So it's really, it isn't even just those two urban sites in specific that are doing work, really focusing on the human dimension and even on human settlements. Thanks, Alan. Um, Kate has a question or a comment here about um, It'd be great to have a communication platform for the LTR students to meet across the sites. And that, that's a, a topic that we've been talking about at the NCO. And we're 
getting closer to having a, a solution for that. So um, no guarantees on the timeline, but that's something that we definitely uh, think about and talk about, and we're trying to find a, uh, a technology that would help, help facilitate that, absolutely. One of the great things about LTR is the network office that Sam just mentioned. Um, they, it's their whole job to make sure that the people who are at the different sites in the network are able to communicate with each other. So, you know, whether it's giving us a Zoom so that we can have a virtual meeting or sometimes uh, making an opportunity for in-person meetings. It's, I think it's one of the things that makes our network succeed and it's one of the things that makes our network unique, a really committed network office. Well, thank you for that, that uh, comment, yes. Um, all right, uh, any last questions? Otherwise, I think we will uh, wrap up in the, looking at the time. And again, always uh, feel free to contact uh, me or I'm assuming anybody else on this, on this line, we'd be happy to answer your questions or at least tell you who to talk to. Sam, in the very beginning, um, the first question we had about how long an LTR should last, and the, end, the common answer was a few decades. Was that the correct answer? <laughs> well, <laughs> centuries, Joshua, centuries. As I was say, we, we, we should talk about long term and long term, right, Dan? I mean, that's 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 the idea, right? We want to have as, the more the longer term data you have, the the better we are at predicting the future and finding, you know, just discovering the natural world. So, um, getting a getting a several decades is great. Uh, getting uh, you know, 10 decades would be even better. So that, that'd be my answer. Dan, what, what do you think? That or, I think that at most sites, you know, you have like these sort of phases of how the ecosystem shifts. So we've been an LTR site for 30 years and we have these experiments where like the first 10 years are completely different from the second 10 years. And then now we're kind of leaving this third phase, which has also been different. So it's hard to know when to end an experiment. It's hard to know when you've learned what you need to learn. We do end experiments sometimes, um, but we keep learning from the long-term ones, so. So um, I, actually, I, I will ping on that just a, a quick second. Joshua, your, your point is interesting because LTR is, is absolutely unique as a program that's funded by the National Science Foundation. NSF's grants are typically three to five years long. Um, and you can, you can learn a lot about a little piece of the natural world or a little piece of a social ecological system um, with three to five years of funding. Um, there have been programs at NSF that have received longer funding than that, but in 1980 when NSF established the LTER network, for the first time ever they said that our, our objective with this program is continuous funding based on merit. And so what happens with the, with the LTR network is when NSF decided, decides that it has money for new sites, and for example, Biological Oceanography just did that and added three new sites, um, so they have money for new sites. They submit a, a request for proposals, a bunch of people send in really good proposals, and NSF decides the three best of those, and maybe a little bit of other things that they decide, and they fund those LTERs. After that point, once you're funded as an LTER, you're, you get six years of funding. You have to send in a renewal proposal every six years. And at that point, you're only competing with yourself. And so you are not competing with anyone else for that next six years of funding. You're just competing with yourself and demonstrating to the NSF and to your peers who review you that you're still doing top-notch research and that you still deserve to be an LTER. And so, and so the reason some of these sites have been funded for 40 years is because they've been doing kick butt LT long-term ecological research for 40 years. And there's no reason if they continue that, that they shouldn't be funded for 40 more. Okay. All right. Thank you for clearing that up. Absolutely. All right. Uh, any last questions do we have uh, from the, the audience? Okay, well, uh, thank you so much again for, for participating. And I uh, hope to see uh, you all on the next, uh, the next webinar we host. And best of luck with your work and presentations coming up and good luck on the next upcoming uh, school year. So thank you so much. And, Bye, everyone. And Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.
terrifying. <laughs> they came alive at the last I minute. I love that chorus. I think we have to have the chorus at the beginning of the next one. 